So yeah, so hello from me. My name's Surya Naga, and uh, yeah, really welcome to um, well to all of you. Um, but yeah, welcome uh, in a way, especially for to well those of you who are new tonight, uh, and those of you who have come from the other room, <laughs> the intro course. Um, really nice to have you here with us as well, uh, and hello to those of you online. So I'm going to be uh, talking to you uh, this evening about. Sangharakshita, so uh, that's the man uh, who's photographed five times <laughs> on the shrine there, and um, he is the founder of our uh, Buddhist tradition. So if you've just finished the course, it's probably, in a way, it's a perfect time <laughs> to learn about Sangharakshita. Um, if it's your first time, it's probably a perfect time as well. Um, and if you've been coming a while, then it's a really good time to uh, get, to know, <laughs> get to know who started this order. <laughs> it's a good time for everyone. Um, and yeah, Sangharakshita uh, has had a kind of incredible life. And for the past uh, little while, I um, can't remember how long, less than a year, more than six months, um, I've been working for a trust called the Yogi and Sangharachita Trust as part of my sort of day job. That Well, that is my day job, working for the Yogi and Sangharachita Trust, uh, which is a, a very, very small charity. Uh, I'm, in fact, the only full-time employee um, that uh, looks after his uh, legacy. So he died uh, three and a half years ago. And, um, yeah, our trust is kind of looking after his uh, work, um, our trustees are the executors of his will, etc. Anyway, um, the the sort of uh, outcome of that is that I've been working on this website. I'm a, I'm, I work as a web designer. Um, and one of the things in that website, one of the main parts of the website that's um, that, that has been kind of, that is being published uh, is a multimedia telling of his life. So I've been compiling um, photos and videos and audio clips and uh, quotes and putting them into a story. Um, yeah, uh, well, a true story. <laughs> but of course, with any story, you're sort of picking and choosing what you include, don't you, and to, to kind of make it make sense. And so that's what I'll be doing tonight as well. I'll be doing it even more sort of uh, ambitiously in a certain sense because got quite a sort of a short amount of time to tell you about his very long life. Um, as you can see from the photos, his life has spanned um, most of the 20th century. And I think after looking at his life quite a lot, I think that the sort of central question at the heart of his whole life that in a way I'll, I'll be exploring is can a Buddhist life really be lived today? Can a, can a sort of truly Buddhist life be lived today? Um, and it is a real question, I think. It's a real question. And it's, it seems to be a real question that was really at the heart of Sangharachita's whole life. So, um, so yeah, I'll be exploring that. So at the start of his life, so Sangharachita was born in 1925. Um, the 26th of August, 1925. And uh, he, he was born in Tooting, uh, in South London, um, to a sort of working class family. Um, his, his father was a furniture polisher. Um, and uh, yeah, in a way, very sort of unlikely beginnings in a, in a certain sense. And um, he talks about his his early years in a sort of like, you know, I was just sort of like any other kind of boy. Um, so you've got this first picture here of him. Um, I think he's about five or six in that photo. Um, but then when he was eight years old, um, something happened which changed his life quite dramatically, which was that he was diagnosed um, with a heart condition which meant, um, well, the, do the instruction from the doctor um, was that this boy, um, who was called Dennis Lingwood, by the way, I haven't mentioned his name, his name at this point is Dennis Lingwood. Uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't born Sangharachita. Um, has to stay in bed and not move. He's not even allowed to sit up straight without uh, being assisted because if he exerts himself in any way, his heart will 
um, or he'll die, basically. Um, so, uh, yeah, so he had to stay in bed and to kind of entertain himself, he started reading a lot of books. So he became a really, really avid reader, um, read all sorts of things. So he'd, he was reading kind of huge uh, bits of literature. So um, I think he read Paradise Lost before he was even a teenager and things like that. And he was just, he was reading huge um, amounts of kind of uh, uh, literature. He also started reading encyclopedias. Um, I mean, he must have been really bored. <laughs> um, he started reading, uh, so there was these big volumes of children's encyclopedias that somebody bought him. And um, it, it was in that, those books where he saw his first uh, image of a Buddha, for, um, but also started to learn really about all sorts of cultures all around the world. Um, so he became very, very um, learned from a very, very young age. Um, at some point, he, after a few years of that, he was uh, allowed to sort of get up and, and move around again. But it wasn't until um, uh, a bit later that he found out that actually uh, it was a misdiagnosis in the first place. So he didn't even need to be uh, in bed. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's possible that um, that time as well also kind of gave him some something, some sort of proclivity to meditation as well, because he said he would just like sit there, lying there staring at the wall for hours on end. Um, yeah, so he possibly kind of, in a way, worked out something of how to meditate as well in that time. Something that did happen uh, in his teenage years, so he, he carried on um, being very much a sort of avid reader, uh, spent all of his time at the library, basically, and um, and going to bookshops and things. And he started to get into um, uh, more and more sort of, um, well, particularly for that time, kind of weird bits of kind of culture. Um, so he read a book called Isis Unveiled, and that made him uh, understand that actually he wasn't a Christian. Um, he'd, he'd been pretty convinced that he was a Christian up until that point, I mean, partly just the culture, of course. Um, but he had, he did have a sort of response, um, but it was kind of, it somehow had a bit of a ceiling to it. Um, anyway, ISIS unveiled, um, which isn't about, by the way, um, Islamic terrorists, <laughs> just to make that clear, um, made him, made him realize that he wasn't a Christian. And then uh, a little while later, he read the Diamond Sutra, which is a very, very famous, very, very um, profound, but, well, and um, uh, mind boggling <laughs> um, text, um, all about the kind of nature of reality. And it's full of paradoxes. Um, so it's one of many, many Buddhist texts that are full of paradoxes and in sort of trying to wrangle your head around these paradoxes, um, the, the reader, the practitioner uh, is, um, can, can start to see the nature of reality. And he read this text, um, he bought it from an esoteric bookshop in London and he read this text when he was about 16 and um, I mean for pretty much anybody, <laughs> um, you'd read this text and have no idea kind of what it's saying. But he had seemed to have this amazingly kind of um, amazing experience of um, realizing, he, 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 this is how he describes it, he realized at this point that he was a Buddhist and always had been um, from reading the Diamond Sutra. So he had this very strong um, kind of insight experience and um, uh, he talks about in his first volume of memoirs, which is called The Rainbow Road from Tooting Broadway to Kalimpong. Uh, we'll get to Kalimpong in a bit. Uh, he, he talks about this period of life just after he read the Diamond Sutras, all of these kind of um, amazing kind of uh, consciousness expanding experiences happening. He even starts talking about how he started to see things before they would happen and then they would happen. And, all sorts of things happen, happening like that to him. 
Um, but he was very much kind of in the wrong time and place, of course. So he's in, the, he's in uh, we're into um, the 1930s now. Actually, we're into uh, World War II has already started in London um, by this point. Um, and he seeks out and finds the only kind of Buddhist organisation in London called the Buddhist Society. And, um, you know, he's quite happy to have found a group of kind of um, like-minded uh, people, um, uh, you know, gets a chance, they chant the refuges and precepts, etc. Um, uh, but he has a sense that... Um, it's quite well it's quite small basically it's a very it's very much a handful of handful of people in london but they seem to be quite dedicated i mean they they um were meditating or quite literally whilst bombs were falling on london um so that's quite something um but then of course all this world <laughs> what's going on in the world at the moment uh, as it always does as we've uh, seen what the, how the, what's going on in the world can kind of affect as individually, it starts affecting him. Uh, in that, he reaches the age where he's old enough to be conscripted, and so he has a medical examination. And it's at this point that he finds out that he was uh, misdiagnosed, uh, uh, and you know the the doctor, the army doctor, um, deems him well enough for active service. So he goes through training. And um, actually, whilst he's in training, um, his home gets blown up by a bomb. Luckily, nobody was in at the time, but it's quite a symbol, isn't it? Um, you know, for, I don't know what for, but it's a symbol for something. Um, his home was blown up by a, by a bomb. Um, and then he is sent um, by chance to India. So that's where he's posted to. Um, obviously, he has no control over this. He didn't even know where he was going until he was um, on the boat and in, the, in the, you know, on, the, on his way there. Um, but he's sent to India, and whilst in India, he starts kind of um, trying to find um, as much as he can, um, you know, more about Buddhism, but uh, also more about Hinduism because that was much more kind of the prevalent uh, religion. Uh, in India, it still is. Um, and so he starts to meet. He doesn't meet many Buddhists um, because there aren't many Buddhists around in India to meet at that point. Um, so he mostly he's mostly kind of spending time with um, kind of in uh, Hindu um, uh, uh, swamis, and um, that gives him. I guess enough kind of inspiration in, uh, to start to have this really, really strong desire to live a full spiritual life. Uh, so he's already realised he's a Buddhist. He's already kind of uh, starting to practice in whatever ways he can. But now he's starting to really start to feel like I want to live a really full uh, spiritual life. Um, uh, yeah. So. What happens is that when the after the, just after the war ends, he decides he's going to stay in India. Um, of course, he can't stay in India because he's got to come back and be um, what's the word like decommissioned, de demobbed, de de yeah, um, yeah, let go of the, uh, from the army. And um, so what he does is he technically kind of deserts the army um, uh, well he does desert the army before they come back this is after the war has ended um, and he burns his passport <laughs> and um, decides to become a homeless wanderer basically so Prandi Manis was mentioning in the announcements uh, just then about how you know in the in the very very early days of the Buddha the Buddha uh, and for many years after that there were no kind of monasteries or Buddhist institutions or anything they were just kind of um, wandering um, wandering kind of in a way freelance monks and nuns um, and effectively that's what he's doing here he's sort of kind of harking back to um, very very early days of um, of the Buddha and and the Buddha's followers. Um, and he goes, so he goes forth uh, with a friend. 
um, and becomes a homeless wanderer. Um, yeah, so he then spends the next two years um, sleeping in ashrams and caves um, and uh, basically just trying to live a sort of full um, full uh, spiritual life in this sense. Actually, I just want to kind of ask you maybe at this point, so at this point he's burnt his passport, he's with, he's with a friend, they're wearing robes, um, uh, do you feel like he's living a full Buddhist life yet? <laughs> so you're shaking your head. Yes. But, oh, oh yeah. Okay. You two are gonna have a debate. <laughs> <laughs> you said yes. Go on. Why, why did you say yes? Because it might be a bit controversial. Go on. Mind it. Yeah. We are all Buddhists, but we just don't know it. Okay, we're all. I would say he, yeah. he, even if he didn't know it, he was living it. Right, right. So he was. So he was already living a Buddhist life. And because he, well, and he, he, I would say yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. What were you going to say? I was going to say no because um, even though I'm sure it's incredibly challenging to live in a monastery, I've often thought, oh, you know, it, surely that environment is made to be conducive to pursuing. A kind of you know spiritual life as you've said but that's not reality for many people mm. and if buddhism is about connecting with and recognizing that we are all one and the same then to take yourself out and almost i guess you know you're kind of putting yourself in a bit of a privileged position mm. where you can kind of protect yourself from distractions mm. and i think that's that's admirable and i'm mm. not criticizing it in any way but if you can go beyond that and bring that back mm. you know it's that idea of going up with wisdom and coming back with kindness if that's how I put it slightly wrong but yeah I think there's mm. there's a step beyond the like, living mm. a truly full spiritual life mm, interesting go on Chris I think yeah. he's looking for something and he hasn't found it yet but he will okay 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 yeah yeah he's looking for something that hasn't found it yet Great, yeah, thank you for uh, all of those. Perfect answers, I think. Yeah, yeah, per all perfect answers, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so he's, he's in these kind of two years of wandering around and um, sort of going to various different teachers at this point, kind of... Um, uh, anyone who you know he, he, he hears about various different teachers who've got various different attainments and then at a certain point he has while staying in a cave uh, he has a vision of the Buddha Amitabha actually the Buddha Amitabha is on the shrine here at the LBC um, uh, usually um, coloured red uh, Amitabha is um, and he has this very kind of vivid vision of uh, red Amitabha. And um, anyway, the way that he describes this is that this vision um, makes him feel like actually it's time to end uh, the homeless wandering period and seek ordination. So he's going to now, uh, he wants to become a monk. He wants to be part of um, a Sangha. So he finds um, they 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 find a um, somewhere where they think it will be a good place to get ordained. Um, in fact, it's the uh, the birthplace of the Buddha, the Mahabodhi Society, which is the um, the only real kind of Buddhist institution really in in uh, India at that time, and they are um, a Theravadan. Um, uh, organization, so quite an orthodox um, Buddhist organization. And he gets to them and um, with his friend and they have been kind of not handling money or anything and um, basically they go and ask for ordination and they're pretty kind of harshly rejected basically, they're pretty harshly kind of said um, no, <laughs> um, we're not going to ordain you. Um, they didn't really quite know at the time uh, why, um, but it was basically because uh, they would get, this organisation would get a lot of kind of um, homeless people and beggars just coming to get ordained so that they would get um, kind of looked after basically. Um, 
so that's why that was happening but uh basically that that what they received was a very un, yeah not not a very warm welcome <laughs> well not really a welcome at all um luckily they do hear from uh they do hear about somebody who they can get ordained from and end up kind of walking all the way to um the place where the buddha died um uh in blistering heat uh and find somebody who uh does ordain ordain them and um uh so it's a very senior monk um ordains them and gives them new names so that's where that's the point at which um dennis lingwood becomes uh sangha rakshita <clears throat> so a short while after this um his friend decides to go off to Sri Lanka to kind of stay in a, in a monastery. Um, Sangharashtra can't go to Sri Lanka because he's not got a passport. Um, <laughs> uh, so he uh, has to find another option. And um, he, they, they kind of meet this, um, this monk um, called Jagdish Kashyap, who uh, becomes Sangharashtra's teacher. He stays with um, Sangharashtra comes stays with Jagdish Kashyap, um, who's a Theravada monk teaching at the uh, Banaras uh, Hindu University, and he teaches kind of Pali and uh, Buddhist logic. Sangharashtra studies with him very kind of intensely, it seems, uh, and starts to have this idea that um, after reading uh, something in a book by Thomas Merton starts to have this idea that he needs to um, surrender his will completely to his teacher and that's how that he will kind of go beyond the ego. Um, yeah, so Sangharashtra at this point, by the way, I should say, is about uh, 20, 21, I think. Um, and he has this really, really strong uh, sense that um, that he, he needs to completely surrender his will to his teacher and do whatever his teacher says. So um, that's not going to go wrong, is it? Um, <laughs> actually, his teacher... Um, uh, I don't think he ever tells his teacher that, that, he's, he, that he's doing this, but he said he found it really, really hard because his teacher was just so unassuming and he would always ask him what he wanted to do. <laughs> so he found it really difficult to surrender his will to him. Um, but But one day he does give him... A very sort of clear instruction actually um, they go to um, uh, a small town uh, on the border of the Himal um, it, well in the foothills of the Himalayas um, near the border of India um, and uh, Jagdish Kashyap decides actually he's going to go and meditate in the forest for a while <laughs> doesn't know how long but he's going to go off uh, he needs to go and do his, do his thing and he says to uh, Sangharachita you stay here and work for the good of B Buddhism <laughs> and uh, so he leaves him alone um, by this point actually um, uh, I think Sangharachita is 23 or 24 actually uh, by this point um, and so he leaves him alone in this in this town um, with yeah, with, with this um, instruction. And Sangharashita does that. He stays there for quite a long time, actually. He stays there. Um, well, I'll tell you when we get to it how long he stayed there for. Uh, but he does work for the good of Buddhism. He sets up a new Buddhist organisation called the Young Men's Buddhist Association um, and uh, teaches the young men from around the uh, around the town Buddhism as well as kind of English and helps them with their studies um, he also uh, ends up becoming um, known for his articles he starts up a magazine called Stepping Stones and uh, then later that kind of gets so, so kind of popular in the sort of um, Buddhist kind of world that's still very small but spread out kind of all around the world really um, that he, when that magazine sort of folds, he then gets hired by the Mahabodhi Society to be the, become the editor of their journal. Um, so there's some sort of <laughs> change in perception of him there. And um, 
and he becomes further kind of well known when he puts out this book um, uh, uh, based on some lectures he wrote called A Survey of Buddhism. So it's often considered his kind of magnum opus, which he, or the lectures uh, he gave were when he was 26, I think it was, uh, and then a couple of years later the book version came out. Um, and it's this incredibly uh, incredible book which, well, surveys all of Buddhism, um, looks at all of the kind of major um, traditions, strands, you could say, of, of Buddhism um, and makes this very strong, very um, solid um, argument for what they have in common um, and what's kind of essential about, about these different Buddhist traditions. Um, which at the time was, I think, was quite a sort of remarkable thing for uh, to do, particularly in the English English language, because there just wasn't that much around about Buddhism. Um, it's, it was still very kind of uh, uh, little understood. Uh, it actually came out in the year that was the two thousand five hundredth anniversary of the Buddha's enlightenment, and um, somebody quite notable, I think, said it was the most important thing that happened that year in Buddhism. Um, little accolade of Safi Buddhism. Um, yeah, maybe I'll ask you this question again. <laughs> so, same question. Do you feel like at this point he's living a full Buddhist life? Yeah. My answer hasn't changed. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, go on. Is it, is it maybe like hard to really give a good answer to that because we don't know sort of how it's interacting moment to moment? Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good, good thing to think about. Yeah. So we don't know his daily sort yeah. of time, medication, and routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like how much time is he spending on Instagram? And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he 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 would have been spending uh, a lot of his time meditating, writing, or kind of teaching, basically, at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good 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 thing to think about. I'm going to keep asking this same I question. Think the by question the way, is also not you know, it's a bit. There's no clear answer to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Define, yeah. Define what you mean by yeah, 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 yeah. These are all good responses. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so this next bit of his life is, I think, my favourite bit. <laughs> um, I think it's the most exciting sort of episode in his life. So he. Um, uh, this is now in 1957, so we're moving forward a little bit. He's now been living in Kalimpong for seven years, and he's uh, starting to um, become more well known around, um, well, certainly around around the kind of Buddhists around around India. And he's due to go and give a talk in Nagpur um, just six weeks after a very historic event has happened in Nagpur. Uh, so Nagpur is pretty much right in the centre of India. Um, and uh, he, this historic event is that Dr. Ambedkar, so who is, um, uh, was born into the lowest caste, so the, what, what was called the untouchable caste. Um, so, you know, wasn't allowed to kind of drink from the same water as the people who weren't in that caste. And, um, and, and was very much were very much kind of um, yeah oppressed and stigmatized because of uh, the caste that they were born into. So a doctor Ambedkar uh, was born into that caste, um, became a uh, lawyer um, uh, quite amazingly became a lawyer and uh, kind of led this incredible kind of peaceful revolution um, of these. Um, uh, ex untouchables and the sort of in a way the climax of that was that he converted to buddhism after researching lots of different religions because he said that actually he needed to leave the um he needed to leave hinduism so the caste system being um part of part of hinduism 
uh, he needed to leave Hinduism completely and become a, become a Buddhist. So he converted to Buddhism. Um, he'd actually had quite a few exchanges with Sangharachita, including asking him to lead the conversion ceremony that Sangharachita said that uh, an Indian monk should, should do it, a senior Indian monk should, Indian monk should do it. Uh, so Ambedkar converted publicly to Buddhism and then and then led the conversion ceremony of um, of some of his followers. In fact, five hundred thousand of his followers who had gathered. Um, so, in one swoop, basically, the um, this very very tiny religion in in India that had all but died out, basically Buddhism, suddenly became um, uh, well, still quite small for in terms of in, uh, sc the scale of India, but uh, much much bigger. Uh, anyway, back to Sangharachita's life, he um, is booked to uh, give, a, give a talk in Nagpur. He actually goes earlier than he, than he thought, than he was, he was intending to, just because he has a really, really strong feeling that he needs to be, uh, he needs to go earlier. And he doesn't know why, but he just, he was actually having quite a nice time basically with, with friends in, a, uh, in Delhi. Um, uh, which is a whole story in itself, actually. But uh, he he has this strong feeling that he needs to be on his way. He gets on the train, and when he gets uh, to Nagpur station, there are two thousand Buddhists <laughs> waiting for him. New Buddhists waiting for him. Uh, he says that the last time he was in Nagpur, there was like a handful of, of people. Um, you know, as sort of a normal sized group to kind of greet you at a train station. But he says there's like 2,000 uh, Buddhists, uh, new Buddhists, uh, waiting for him, um, chanting victory to Ambedkar, uh, victory to Sangharachita, just because he's a Buddhist monk who's coming to visit, basically. Uh, and they're really excited about this new religion that is completely freeing them um, from the oppression of uh, the caste system. So he... Um, goes off to wherever he's staying, starts to try to get some rest. But just a couple of hours later after he's arrived, he's given some sudden um, terrible news that Dr. Ambedkar has died. Dr. Ambedkar has died just six weeks after uh, converting to Buddhism and leading the conversion of um, all of all of his followers. Um, and everybody's distraught, completely distraught. You know, they were—they were just—they've were just, just been kind of, uh, yeah. Um, they, they don't know what they're going to do. And uh, they say to Sangharachita, "You need to." There are crowds out there uh, asking for, for you to come and address them, <laughs> um, say something to them. Uh, so he says, "Well, you know, okay, if we're going to do this, like get some microphone and speakers and stuff, because there's a lot of people." Uh, so they very quickly organise a meeting, and he ends up um, he ends up uh, addressing a lot of people. Actually, I read a quote from this bit. Um, I was going to read it quite earlier, but I forgot. Um, he says about a hundred thousand people had assembled. So this is later on in the evening when uh, they get to a nearby park uh, for this condolence meeting. Though some five or six of Ambedkar's most prominent local supporters one by one attempted to pay tribute to their departed leader, they were so overcome by emotion that after uttering only a few words, they burst into tears and had to sit down. Their example was contagious. When I started to speak, the whole vast gathering was weeping and sobs and groans filled the air. In the cold blue light of the Petromax, I could see grey-haired men rolling in agonies of grief at my feet. Though deeply moved by the sights of so much anguish and despair, I realised that for me at least, this was no time to indulge in emotion. And Bedka's followers had received a terrible shock. They had been Buddhists for only seven weeks, and now their leader, in whom their trust was total, and on whose guidance in the difficult days ahead they had been relying, had been snatched away. So, Sangharashtra goes on to um, uh, tell them that uh, Ambedkar is not dead so long as that they live the values that he has, has taught them. Um, and uh, he's told um, later by many people that his being there was basically a 
kind of miracle because um, nobody else could have kind of done that. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the Buddhist movement was almost very, very much lost. Skip slightly ahead, not, not very much ahead, but just a few weeks later, um, Sangharachita goes back to uh, Kalimpong and um, he, he hears of a local um, uh, kind of wandering kind of mystic basically called Chatra Rinpoche um, who's uh, very much kind of respected by all the kind of local incarnate lamas and um, but very, very sort of strange kind of figure who just kind of wanders about doing whatever he wants basically nobody knows when he's going to quite turn up anywhere and um, Sangharachita has been getting more and more kind of interested although he's a Theravada monk so quite sort of orthodox uh, type of ordination he's been getting more and more and more interested in the breadth and depth of Buddhism as he talks about it in a survey of Buddhism um, so he's so it's quite a different sort of form of Buddhism that you get in kind of Tibet um, this uh, with much more emphasis on the altruistic dimension of Buddhism um, in, in the Mahayana and that finds its expression um, or finds expression is not quite the right word but um, it's just very much related to um, this kind of uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana practice of visualising Buddhas and Bodhisattvas so you get given a, um, a, a, a practice where you visualise a Buddha or Bodhisattva and each person has, has their own each practitioner has their own uh, form of the Buddha that they're given that is specific to them, which is called their Yidam. So this figure, Chachal Rinpoche, he, he's meeting and um, uh, he's talking to Chachal Rinpoche and um, after kind of forming a bit of a kind of trust uh, with him, he asks Chachal Rinpoche, um, can you tell me who my Yidam is? Um, so even in just that question, he's kind of going quite beyond um, his uh, practice as it is as it is up till now. And Churchill Rinpoche says uh, that it's Green Tara. He thinks for a minute and says it's Green Tara. So Green Tara, if you don't know, is a uh, female form of the Buddha uh, who's very uh, beautiful and green, and um, uh, it's often well is pictured. Um, with one leg in meditation uh, posture and one leg stepping out into the world, stepping out onto another lotus to to um, to help the world, to save the world, and she's sometimes called the Bodhisattva of um, spontaneous compassionate activity. So quite incredible that Chachal Rinpoche, who I mean definitely wouldn't have known about what had happened in Nagpur somehow kind of intuited this about Sangharachita just a few weeks about after that, that particular episode. Um, okay, I'm going to speed up again, uh, or jump forward at, uh, at least it, again. Um, actually, before I do, um, Chacha Rinpoche also uh, in that meeting, uh, when, when he, after initiating Sangharachita in the Green Tara Sadhana practice predicts that Sangharachita will soon have his own Vihara, his own his own monastery, um, which just a few weeks later does actually come to pass. He's he's unexpectedly given the funding <laughs> um, by a by a friend uh, in Delhi to start his to buy his own uh, monastery in Kalimpong. So he lives there for another uh, seven years. Um, where he he uh, keeps going on teaching tours um, around particularly the villages where there are um, lots of Ambedkar's followers uh, teaching them about their new religion. Uh, he also, in this period of seven years, um, uh, becomes more and more... Uh, well, has a, has a series of interactions with more... Um, very, very esteemed um, Tibetan uh, teachers, incarnate lamas. Actually, I, ca I counted uh, that he receives um, 11 more sadhanas on top of the one he's already got from five more <laughs> um, Tibetan uh, teachers. Um, 
over the course of that seven years. Uh, so all these different kind of Buddhist and Bodhisattva figures that he's meditating on. And then um, in, what is it, in 1962, um, he receives a letter um, from uh, the English Sangha Trust. Uh, so at this point, he could really very much be, you know, just staying in India for the rest of his life. He's very, very happy, very active um, kind of in India. But he receives this letter from the English Sangha Trust um, to uh, to go back um, uh, to England and uh, to help them with help them establish Buddhist activities. He's ma- he's recently made friends with, at this point with an English monk. Um, and found that, um, uh, well, another English monk uh, found that uh, actually it's quite good being able to speak <laughs> um, English with a fellow Buddhist. Um, and so that's one of the things that kind of convinces him, well, maybe, maybe I will go back. Uh, and his friends sort of, lots of his friends start saying, actually, yeah, it would be really good if you did, um, because England needs Buddhism (laughs) Uh, and you can do that and not many people can Um, so he's sort of initially reluctant but does go back and finds this very sort of um, uh, uh, this one other Buddhist organisation so the Buddhist society still exists but the English Sangha Trust is now also in London Uh, there's these two uh, very very small um, Buddhist institutions quite different in different ways but um, with very much a sort of um, orthodox approach to Buddhism, but both in, in different ways, really, a very sort of ac- academic um, approach to Buddhism. So particularly the Buddhist society, I think Sangharachita felt was um, kind of a bunch of people who wanted to know about Buddhism rather than a bunch of people who wanted to practice Buddhism. Um so he uh, injects a kind of whole load of energy into this whole situation, fi- uh, fixes kind of a, a big rift that's going on between these two institutions, um, and generally starts to kind of build up a bit of a sort of following uh, for himself, despite him being um, quite sort of controversial because he does things like um, sit to have lunch with people who aren't monks. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, grows his hair slightly longer than he's supposed to and things like that. Um, but then it get, he gets a bit more controversial because when he meets a friend, uh, a man called Terry, uh, Terry Delamere. And Terry becomes a very, very important friend uh, for Sangharakshita. Um, Terry is a... Um, Depress- depressive, he's um, re- very sort of depressed and he's um, had a, quite a difficult life uh, himself but in kind of recent years he's been exploring the area of um, psychedelic therapy and uh, this is this is in the 60s I mean actually psychedelic therapy is a whole thing again now but um, uh, and he, that's led him to have this big experience which he describes to Sangharachita on, on his first meeting as seeing the white light, as in the white light that you see when you die, and that's in the Buddhist tradition as well. And Sangharachita is very kind of taken with Terry's, um, kind of, it seems like he's had some sort of insight experience, and um, Sangharachita seems to think very, very highly of this, of this experience, and they become very, very good friends. Um, and one of the aspects of that friendship as well is that uh, Terry um, uh, uh, just kind of doesn't treat him as a sort of monk in the way that the, the others do around the society like he doesn't sort of uh, he just sort of treats him as a kind of equal as a friend um, basically um, he even calls him Dennis I mean I don't recommend you call like order members by their old name or anything but it's quite interesting like uh, that's part that's part of it for him and um yeah sometime uh, at some point when he's with terry he starts even um he's up till this point he's been wearing robes you know he's a monk he's been wearing robes um but he starts even kind of goes to the shops for the first time it's quite a nice point in um uh this volume of, the, of his memoirs um 
we're up to the fourth volume of his memoirs, by the way, now, um, where he goes to the shop and he doesn't know what people his age sort of wear. <laughs> so he doesn't really know what he should be wearing now. Um, but anyway, he starts wearing clothes that aren't, that aren't, uh, to do, aren't amongst clothes. But it's interesting what was actually the controversial point in, in all of that. So he was spending a lot of time with Terry, sometimes going around to his house. Um, there was never any... Um, there was very much a friendship, so it wasn't ever kind of uh, sexual or anything. But these rumours basically start going around that uh, he is having a sexual relationship um, with Terry. Actually, something I was going to mention much earlier was that Sangharashtra had realised that he was gay um, when he was in, um, when he was a teenager, um, uh, and he writes about how much that kind of made him feel like a an outsider, uh, particularly in the army. Um, uh, but of course, that's not really been sort of an issue. Um, well, who knows how much of an issue it was in a way, but it's not been. Um, an active part of the story so far because of course he's been a celibate monk um, he's still a celibate monk by, by this point um, but these rumours start going around uh, that he is um, yeah, having, having a, some sort of homosexual relationship with, with Terry um, uh, this by the way is the um, I think it's the year before homosexuality gets partially criminalised. Um, so this is 1967. Um, or maybe it's the same year, I can't remember now. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's around the same time. Um, and he gets this letter, uh, actually, when um, uh, he, he receives the letter when he's on a trip with Terry back to India uh, to say goodbye to all of his friends because he's decided that actually he is going to stay in England goes to India, um, starts saying goodbye to people and then receives this letter from the English Sangha Trust. Um, uh, shall I read this? Yeah, I'll read, I'll read just a bit of it. So, um, uh, so my relationship with Terry was, it was alleged, was of a homosexual nature. And as Toby Christmas Humphreys, who was the sort of um, leader of the Buddhist society, pointed out, the English middle class mind had an abhorrence that even the appearance of homosexuality was sufficient, it seemed, to warrant a man's banishment from decent society, or as I had found, his removal from the position he occupied. Um, what this meant, actually I'll read this bit, yeah, what this meant in effect, at least in England, was that it was difficult for men to develop more than ordinarily close friendships without incurring the suspicion of homosexuality, and in some cases the unpleasant and even painful consequences of such suspicion. Um, yeah, so when um, Sangharachita read uh, the letter, he turned to Terry and he said, uh, do you know what this means? This means a new Buddhist movement. <laughs> so uh, he, he kind of instantly sort of knows, well, <laughs> you know, obviously can't carry on with them, but I'm not going to not go back to England. Actually, that's what they're telling him to do in the letter. They're, they say to him, just stay in India, actually. Um, uh, but he doesn't do that. He comes back, uh, and he founds a new Buddhist movement. He has he has some supporters um, who who think that it's really unjust that he's um, been uh, fired in the way that he has, and they start me meeting um, in 1967, and this is the um, start of the Charatna Buddhist community. Actually, they start meeting in a basement in Monmouth Street uh, in central London. Um, he starts leading meditation classes there. Um, uh, actually it was called the Charatna Shrine Room the, anyway uh, he, he starts uh, this kind of community around him and then a year later after that after starting that community he starts the order so he's decided he doesn't want just a society he doesn't want just a sort of club of people that you know just sort of are interested in doing a bit of Buddhism uh, he wants people who he wants to start a real tradition of people who are really really dedicating uh, their lives to it, really transforming their lives with Buddhism. And at this point, he started to kind of go, "That's not going to be at least in the West, at least in the modern world, um, a 
a kind of order, an, a monastic order, where there's this divide between um, the monks and the lay, he starts to realise that it needs to kind of sort of, in a way, transcend that kind of divide, not like compromise between them, but actually kind of go, go beyond that divide. Um, so he, he uh, I suppose he starts saying to people, uh, do, you want to do, do you want to do this? And in 1968, um, so the central photo there, um, in there, I've not really been talking about the different photos very much, but the central photo um, is the very, very first ordination that happens. So uh, it's actually the very first order member that you can see there getting, um, being given a, a, a casa, which marks our ordination. Um, uh, and quite sig well, very significantly, it's it's also um, happens to be a woman who uh, was the first order member, which um, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, as far as I know, is the first time that a woman has ever been given in Buddhist history equal ordination to to a man, um, and in technically kind of actually senior because yeah, uh, the order. Um, uh, yeah, and of course he's very much kind of um, embracing any sexuality as well as gender. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think how I can tell the rest of this story really, really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Those who know of it will know the challenge that, that I've got at this point. <laughs> So a couple of things happen very quickly after this, um, after the ordination. In fact, just, I think it's just one week, seven days after the very first ordination, Terry um, commits suicide. So he, um, he throws himself under a train uh, in Camden. Um, I mean, it's... It's hard to say really what Sangaracha's relationship was was with Terry, um, other than just saying they were friends. They were definitely they were definitely sort of just friends in that sense. But um, the way that he writes about him, it's very possible that he was sort of in love with him. That's kind of in a way me making making assumptions um, just from the way that he wrote him. But he certainly um, he certainly loved him anyway. He certainly loved him. Uh, and he was certainly very, very distraught when um, when Terry uh, died. Uh, some friends of his, uh, some of the early order members, uh, say that he cried every day for for a year. Um, but he also carried on. <laughs> he also, uh, quite amazingly, actually, um, carried on um, getting the order going. Um, yeah, he, he, he got the order going. But he also um, carried on sort of exploring what this whole um, idea of um, not being a monk and <laughs> not being lay means. Um, so part of that meant that he started having sex. So um, I don't quite know, I haven't quite worked it out actually with the dates, but a, a little while after Terry died, um, I think it was... Um, he had his first sexual experience with uh, with somebody, with a man, um, called Carter, who he then had a bit of a sort of relationship with. Um, and then in the preceding years, um, uh, carried on having various sexual relations, um, many of which were with um, people in the kind of order and community. So this would have been kind of fairly well known in this very, very small, you know, this very tiny community as it, as it, as it was. Um, and then the community started growing. It grew fairly um, quickly. I mean, um, uh, wait, I sort of have to mention that because, yeah, but obviously the only, th <laughs> the only thing going on, he was also teaching Buddhism and um, bringing Buddhism into the modern world. And the modern world at that point was... Um, the late 60s going into the 70s and so that meant kind of um, making Buddhism relevant to all of these hippies <laughs> basically um, uh, so yeah he experimented with um, 
with with drugs as well. He experimented with um, with with sex. He was kind of looking into what friendship means uh, in the context of living a full Buddhist life as well. Um, I mention all that as partly as well because well, I mean I think it is an important part of his story, um, but also partly because that story then got picked up in quite a sort of big way. So. Um, uh, later on, some of the people who he had relation, uh, sexual relations with or relationships with um, uh, felt that actually they weren't happy about that. They weren't happy about the fact that they, um, they were having uh, these relationships with basically their teacher, um, uh, the leader of, of the kind of uh, the order that they were, they were part of. Um, he's kind of, just to say briefly, um, uh, I'm not going to kind of get into like, oh, was it right or was it wrong or some, or, or anything, but just to say something that he said, which I found find quite interesting um, about this. He's kind of said, well, I've never really, I never really felt like um, it was a sort of hierarchy because I was so sexually inexperienced, um, which I find quite interesting. I mean, he was kind of in his forties by this point, but of course, you know, he'd, he'd been celibate for most of his life. Um, uh, so yeah. Anyway, I think that's quite quite an interesting part of the story. Um, anyway, that caused. Um, I'll start to wrap up now into the kind of last period, last sort of a uh, couple of decades of his life. Um, that caused quite a bit of um, friction, <laughs> you could say, um, problems. <laughs> Um, particularly when those stories hit the media, um, uh, I think by the t- by this point, Sangaracha had become celibate again for a long time, and the order had grown so much. Um, so, I think the first big um, media story was in the Guardian in ninety seven, and uh, by this point, Sangaracha had been celibate for quite quite a long time again, um, and uh, a lot of and the order had grown quite a lot. A lot of order members didn't even know <laughs> about all of that. Um, so it became, not just for that reason, but um, it became quite a bit of a, an issue. Anyway, at this point, the order really could have almost been lost again. Um, uh, yeah, really could have kind of almost been, been lost because there was a lot of, it's a really, really complicated issue. Um, really, really complicated issue, um, and there's been a lot of conversation about it. Um, yeah, a lot of conversation about it. A lot of kind of work to be d- done in terms of um, uh, what's the word? Re, um, re, uh, re. <laughs> working out if uh, you know. Uh, Appraising. No. <laughs> Sorry. Reassess, yeah, lo- reassessing, that's not the word I was thinking of. Restoration, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of kind of restorative work has been done um, with the people who've been upset about their relationship with Sangha Um uh, But yeah, also a lot of people just kind of losing confidence in him as a teacher. Um, uh, but what happens towards the end of his life? Um, and this is as much as anything because he, um, you know, is getting old, and um, you know, one in two thousand one, I think it is, he goes blind. Um, he begins to um, start handing over um, uh, the sort of leadership of the order. And I think this is a really important um, part of his life story: is that he hands over the movement, um, the leadership of the movement to his most trusted uh, senior disciples. He doesn't um, appoint one person to lead, <coughs> lead uh, the order in his stead. He appoints a whole kind of group um, uh, which become the College of Public Preceptors. There's a whole kind of period of about 20 years or something of um, the process of handing over. But um, yeah, they, they um, kind of take sort of a spiritual charge for one of a better phrase um, of of the order and what we're sort of left with 
is this order which has an incredible amount of um, uh, variation in terms of how people practice within it, particularly in terms of lifestyle. Um, you know, all these people who've had to work out what does um, living a fully Buddhist life mean um, for them, and they have all got different answers to it. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, since I joined the order, sometimes I think, do we, do we actually have, <laughs> like, how much do we actually have in common in a certain sense? But of course, what we have in common is is this order that Sankarachita founded, this vision that Sankarachita founded that's of a Buddhist life that can be lived today, um, but, n but something that's not being kind of led by... Um, by one person in a way and in a way like the, the sort of uh, what I think of as um, you know the, the one of the, the act four of the story um, uh, kind of showed us the sort of dangers of, of that um, uh, but also showed us how important um, kind of staying true to his kind of vision of the Dharma so his vision of um, a, a fully a real kind of Buddhist community is as well. So yeah, so uh, that's what we were kind of left with when he died in uh, two thousand eighteen, and he clarified a lot of those points as well. Actually, before he died, he was writing right up until he died uh, by dictation. Um, uh, yeah, and his funeral was um, yeah attended by. Um, by huge amounts of people in Adishtana, if you've been to Adishtana. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're, we're at the end um, of the story, we're at the end of his life. Um, uh, so I was just going to finish by um, saying, so, saying a bit about this, more about this project that um, I'm working on. So, um, working on this project, sangarachita.org, um, I just kind of ask you um, if you're interested to find out more about his life. I've had to kind of go over things quite quickly tonight, but do um, do have a look at sangarachita.org. Um, we're releasing a new chapter of his life story uh, each week, and we're about eight chapters or so in, um, and it's full of um, images and video and audio and quotes from his memoirs. And, um, and there's also volumes of his memoirs uh, on sale tonight as well, so you can... Um, check out Rainbow Road, which is the first volume. So now we're going to go into the puja section of the evening. <laughs> right. Yep. So was he teaching here? Did he grow the sangha here in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He lived uh, at this centre for a while. Yeah, yeah. I had to sort of skip over that a little bit, but yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, he was here. Yeah, yeah. There's photos of him sat right in this spot actually, um, teaching stuff. Good, so we're going to move on to the puja section of the evening now. So we're going to have a short, um, very short um, uh, break. Um, so you can go to the toilet and whatever you do, whatever you need to do. Um, and we'll be back in here in a few in a few minutes. So we'll call you back in. Okay.